Welcome. This is Peter Vug, founder of the prestigious Game Changers Academy. And thank you guys for tuning into our monthly millionaire video series where we interview the world's most elite and successful entrepreneurs, CEOs, <clears throat> entertainers, and true game changers. People that I personally have massive respect for who are making a huge difference, not just in their industries, but in the world. And you guys are in for a very special treat today as we have a true game changer. He's a retired Navy SEAL and the only member of the U.S. Armed Forces to complete SEAL training, including two hell weeks, the U.S. Army Ranger School, where he graduated as enlisted honor man and Air Force Tactical Air Control uh, Controller training. He's one of the best in the world when it comes to maximizing potential, developing mental toughness, and really pushing past limits. He's an ultra marathon runner, ultra distance cyclist, triathlete, a former world record holder for the most pull-ups done in 24 hours. He's completed over 60 ultra marathons, triathlons, and ultra triathlons. He's the best-selling author of Can't Hurt Me, which is an absolute game-changing book that you guys all want to uh, want to get. We'll talk about this a little bit later. And he's someone who ran 200 plus miles without stopping. And this guy had a brutal childhood. Joe Rogan says he firmly believes it's people like David that could really inspire the world to push harder and dig deeper. And he's the definition of walking the walk and leading by example. Enough talking. You guys know who he is. Mr. David Goggins, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you, man. Hey, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, brother. Yeah, I'm excited. So I, I want to start with this. I've been di it it's been fascinating diving into your story and the content you've created, uh, how you came to be who you are now. I want to start with this so people have context. This statement stuck with me. You said, I hated what I saw in the mirror so much, I had to make a change. A lot of people hate what they see in the mirror, but they get worse and do nothing. What was the difference? Can you kind of talk about that statement and, and what that meant to you? Yeah, man, period. Dot. So the shit haunted me. So a lot of people can look in the mirror and they get that one little glimpse of, you know, like it's like a quick snapshot of themselves. And then they have, the, they have the ability of walking away, of walking away from that mirror and that mirror stays where it's at. They go where the fuck they got to go, but it doesn't stay with them. That, that snapshot stayed with me everywhere I went, when I slept, when I ran, I mean, anything I did in my car, you know, spraying for cockroaches, everywhere I went, that snapshot haunted me. So it's kind of like this, man. Have you ever been in a fight before and there's this guy that wants to beat your ass and you know that you can't beat his ass and you're a little bit scared and he's telling you that he's going to beat your ass next week? For the whole week, you're nervous. The whole week you're scared. You can't you can't go to the bathroom. You can't you can't eat. You can't sleep. That's what it did to me. I was haunted by my own reflection. So that's that's what made me change, man. So just just being scared. Was it was it looking at yourself so much being disgusted that it was like I'm sick of it? Was it like your back was against the wall and you had a like a tipping point, or was it a build up? Do you remember? It was a it was a build up over a lot of years. You know, I'm sure we'll get into my childhood and stuff like that, but. It was a buildup over a lot of years of me just uh, trying to build a, like, um, I wasn't handling what was deep inside me. I was literally just handling surface issues. So what happened was over a period of time, when, when you can pin, like, like, you know, I was putting layer over layer over layer over all these insecurities. And after a while, man, you just, I mean, I just broke. So. So going back to the breaking point, like that tipping point moment, um, cause a lot of people maybe haven't had that or they have, but going from there to the Navy SEALs to now being one of the most sought after speakers and influencers on the planet. Um, right. what was the action steps right after that? So was it, I need to enlist in something that's going to really callous my mind and challenge me or, and, and obviously it's in the book and I've read it, but for you, do you remember like once you were so disgusted, what was that next like self talk to you? So what it was, man, so I broke. I broke way before this, but I had to go back to my father. So my father is the one that started the breaking point for me. So you have to go back to the root of the fucking problem. And I was avoiding that. I hadn't seen my father in years. My father beat the hell out of me. My father was an alcoholic. My father was uh, a, a successful guy in his own right, but he had a lot of demons. 
you know, demons fell off on my brother, me, my mom. So he beat the shit out of us almost every day. So that started my poor foundation. So now I'm like 22, 21 years old, almost 23, around there somewhere. And um, I was a piece of shit. I gained 125 pounds. I was out of shape. I was fat. I was making $1,000 a month spraying for cockroaches. And my life was going nowhere. And I sat back and said, hey, I got to go face the demon. So we had to go back to where the problem started, where the problem originated. And I went back, faced my father after years. And I saw him. You know, we never apologized to each other. It, you know, it was what it was. But the whole key point of all this, man, is you have to go back to the problem. A lot of people may have a sore knee, but it doesn't mean you have a bad knee. It might mean you got fucked up hip. So a sore knee doesn't always mean you got a bad knee. It may mean something else is out of alignment. So for me, I was scared. I was a cheater. I was a, I was an insecure person. So instead of fixing yourself all the time, a lot of times you need to go back to where the problem started. For me, it was my father. So I went back to my father, saw him, talked to him. Um, it, but it didn't fix a lot, but it allowed me to kind of attack the demon. I went back to the demon and then I came back home and that started the, the pursuit of fixing myself. You know, I, I recognized all my faults and I called myself out. I recognized all my faults and that's, and that's so important. You gotta, you gotta stop calling other people out. What we do in life so well is we love judging other people. Fuck that shit, man. You gotta learn to call yourself out. And that's what I started doing every day in my life instead of looking at other people saying, he did this to me. She did this to me. All this shit's fucked up. I said, no, nah, man, this is on you, brother. So I started fixing all my problems with from the inside out. And it started there. So taking the issue head on, I see a lot of people kind of avoiding that issue. And obviously it keeps coming up. So I think diving in and taking the issue head on is huge. And then fixing yourself and calling yourself out. I think we live in a soft society where not only do people not want to call themselves out, they, they feel bad challenging other people as well. So I remember you said something about you were not only scared of your shadow, but you would lie. You would lie to people to be accepted. Okay. And I see that now. So what do you tell that, not just the generation, but what do you tell people right now that want to break out, they want to level up, they want to be themselves, but they're still, they fear people and they're trying to fit in. Was it just continuously telling yourself that you need to level up or you need to break out of your own skin? What was it? You know what I had to do, man? I mean, all those things are great. Leveling up, breaking out, it's great. But what I found out for me, all those words were just fucking words, man. I had to change how I viewed myself. So the reason why I was lying to people because I viewed myself as a piece of shit. So I, I viewed others way above me. But the one thing that other people do so well is they lie too. A lot of people are pieces of shit. So this is the thing about, man, you have to be proud of yourself. And until you have pride, you know, pride in yourself, you're going to always be finding acceptance from other people. So for me, the second I was proud of myself and I realized where I was in life, I stopped holding people on a fucking pedestal. Because by me holding people on a pedestal, that made me start to lie because I felt insecure. I got to catch up. But in instead of catching up for real, I would catch up on the lie. The lie would catch me up and then that would haunt me again. So I kept on digging a deeper hole saying, man, you're not that. You're not this. You're not that. So then that would catch up with me in the mirror. So it kept on snowballing into the fact, you know, you know, to the point where I said, fuck it, man. I got to change everything. I love that. So this reminds me of the story too, the self-talk. You had, you, you were trying to get into an ultra marathon and I believe the, uh, the, the person, the founder of the event or someone that was in charge said, if you want to do this, you need to run a certain amount of miles in 24 hours. And you hadn't really done that before. And at mile 74, 75, you literally, you, you were broken, but that self-talk kept you going. Can you bring back to that story? Because I think that hits home on the importance of self-talk and that kind of set you up for a massive momentum swing from then on. Yeah, so basically, man, so throughout my whole life, once I kind of changed my mindset and started realizing, man, I have to go towards the darkness to improve my mental. So I don't care if you're making money, I don't care if you're trying to be a SEAL, a Ranger, trying to run 10 miles, trying to just be a better dad, a better mom, you've got to challenge yourself. 
So many people don't. So in, in challenging yourself is where you find all the answers. You find all the answers to every question that you will ever have in challenging yourself. So through my life, I started taking the different route. I started challenging myself. So through challenging myself, I started realizing how my mind worked. I start realizing how to motivate myself in dark times. The hardest thing to do in life is to motivate oneself alone. When you are alone and you're fucked up and you're suffering, the hardest thing in the world to do is pull something out of your fucking hat. When there's no one around you clapping, no one around you cheering, no one around you saying, you're good, you're going to make it. So I've taken all this over a period of time now, and it puts me now at this race. So by now, I'm a Navy SEAL. I've lost over 106 pounds in less than three months. I've gone through Ranger School. I've gone through all these different schools. And I, and I kind of started to fine tune three, three hell weeks I was in. I started to fine tune mentality. So that's the thing. First, it's, it's not, it, it doesn't happen overnight. So here I am right now. I fine tune my mentality. And this is the ultimate challenge for me. So I call this race director up. And I'm like trying to get into this race called the Bad Water 135. It's a 135 mile race through Death Valley. And at the time, this is November of 2005. I probably ran 20 miles total the whole year. My workout was literally going to the gym, lift heavy, and 20 minutes every Sunday, 20 minutes every Sunday, I would do the elliptical trainer. That was my cardiovascular workout, man. Every Sunday, I do elliptical trainer. So I called this race director up named Chris Costman. Chris Costin was the race director for the Badwater 135. I want to do this race to raise money for the kids to go to college whose, whose fathers died in war, special operators. So he says, hey, man, I call him up on a Wednesday. He says, hey, you know what, David, to qualify for my race, you got to do 100 miles in 24 hours or less. I'm like, what? Is that even possible pretty much? So there's only two more races I could do before the deadline ended. And the deadline ended in, I, I think it was January. So this is in November, and he calls me out. So I call him on Wednesday. He says, Saturday in San Diego, where I live, is a race called San Diego One Day, where you run around a 20, so, so you run around a one-mile track for 24 hours to so many miles you can get. So I'm like, you know what, man? I did the math. It's about under a 15-minute mile. I could walk that. And I was like, you know what? It was the dumbest shit I ever saw, man. But I went out there, got a blue lawn chair, Ritz Crackers, Mileplex, and I started going. So I'm going on this one mile track. I get to mile 50. I'm pretty broken. But let's cut to the chase. I get to mile 70 and I am fucked up so badly. I've, I've never ran past 26 miles in my life. I didn't train for this race. I was a bodybuilder. My nutrition was wrist crackers and mileplex. I was dizzy. I was dehydrated. I was all messed up. So I hadn't gone to the bathroom literally in 12 or 13 hours. So I sit down in this blue lawn chair. And I'm literally just sitting there and I can't get up. So I literally piss blood down my leg and I'm shitting up my back. And I have over 30 miles to go. So this is when, instead of quitting, like everybody else should have done, like I should have done maybe, but I said, you know what? No, I'm not going to quit yet. I might quit. So I put the idea in my mind. And so if I said, I'm not going to quit yet. So this is where the self-talk comes into play. Self-talk is very important, but you have to give your mind a comfort zone. A comfort zone meaning that you might quit. So, so you put that little fragment in your mind to let your mind kind of relax. Because when you're telling your mind, you know what, I'm not going to quit, it starts to, it starts to panic. Oh my God, we got 30 miles to go. I'm in the worst shape of my fucking life. You just take it step by step. Don't just shut it off. And that, and that refers back to my one second decision. In the one second... The one second decision, we live a whole bunch of one seconds. In that one second, when I was shitting up my back and I was peeing blood down my leg, I was spazzing out. In that one second, when you spaz out, your adrenaline flows. Your adrenaline says, get the fuck out of here, man. You're not ready for this shit. Leave. Go. It's like that fight or flight mode where all you want to do, like in SEAL training, when it's cold and it's and you're, and you're miserable, your mind says, get out of here. And you flee the scene. Versus fighting, you flee the scene. So I created a little space, a little gap. And that gap in that one second is relax your mind. When I was pissing blood and I was, and I was shitting, I was like, okay, relax your mind, man. This is a bad situation. You're fucked up. But just relax. So I relaxed my mind. So instead of quitting, I said, you know what, man? Let's just sit here for a while. Relax. 
your blood pressure is messed up. Let's get some food. Let's hydrate. Let's clean yourself up. You know, let's kind of doctor yourself back up. You might quit. You might quit. That's still in the back of your mind. But let's just keep on doctoring yourself up. So the whole thing about this is calming down. You got to calm yourself down. So I've calmed down. I'm relaxing. But now I'm like, you know what? <clears throat> okay, I'm eating. I'm rehydrating. Let me see if I can stand up. Oh, my blood pressure is okay. I can stand up now. You know what? Let me see if I can walk one mile. This would be pretty amazing if I can walk one mile after being damn near dead. Worst situation in my entire life. Let me see if I can walk one mile. So I walk one mile. I'm like, okay, my God, this is amazing. So now I'm starting to feed off of that one mile I walked after being fucked up. That one mile is two miles, three miles, four miles. And now I'm starting to dig into the cookie jar. The cookie jar is all the things I've overcome in my entire life. And this has become one more thing. You got to dig into that mental mindset of like, my God, I overcame racism, overcame bullying. I taught myself how to read and write. You know, I used to be a big time stutterer. I had an abusive father. You know, it's, it's all those things that it didn't fucking kill you. You are still here. We forget how badass we are in those, you know, in those tough times. You got to remind yourself of this shit. Remind yourself that you're still here. Remind yourself of the things you've overcome. Then that gives you another mile. And then after that next mile, it starts to add up and add up. Before you know it, man, 31 miles later, man, 101 miles in 19 hours and six minutes. I completed that race, man. And I was fucked up afterwards. But the mind is truly the most amazing thing. But that's the one thing that we don't use enough of. Any any last words, David, for everyone watching? Any action they should take right away when watching this? Um, anything else on your mind? Yeah, you know, so so most of your followers are pretty young, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you right now, man, it's fuck, your age group is fucking hard. It is, you are the most confused you will ever be in your fucking life. You just left your mom and dad. They take care of all your shit. And now you're out here and you're hearing these voices in your head about go left, go right. You're not the best at shit. You don't have much money or you do have money. You're, you're, you're all over the place. You're either weak mind. We, we all were millennials at one time. We were all in that age group of fucking poopy pants and snot under our fucking nose and wet behind the ears. And this right now, this time right now where you're at was a time I made the biggest difference in my life. From 19 to 26, I was the most fucked up, but I also made the biggest jumps. This is where I started to create David Goggins and now into Goggins. So really, this is the hardest time of your life. But if, if you make the right fucking move right now, you'll be sitting back in your early 40s, early 50s, whatever, sitting back, kicking it. So right now, you got to you gotta fucking really embrace the storm, embrace the suck, get through this time frame, get your head on straight. And I guarantee you, man, at the end of it all is a glorious fucking time. Start with this book, guys. The legend, David Goggins, thank you so much, man. Much respect. Let me know if there's anything I can do to continue help spreading the message, spreading your word. Uh, much respect, man. And thanks again for taking the time to speak to our game changers. Hey, man, I appreciate you, man. Stay hard, brother. Amazing. Talk to you soon. Later. Wow. Uh, I know you guys are giving a lot of feedback. You guys are fired up and excited. Um, one of the best calls we've ever had, and we've had a lot of game-changing calls with some legends. So my challenge, what's the one or two takeaways that – you feel right now are most relevant to your biggest challenge in business and life based on what stage you're at write that down and take action on it anything that shifted your emotional frequency the goal is to operate with massive clarity but understand that you need to take action on this right away not theory don't think about it really take action on what you know you should be doing i don't want to thank you guys for being a part of this powerful community i appreciate you let's continue to think and act like game changers and have an amazing rest of your day and we'll talk to you guys soon You have to have a genuine core, unshakable belief that what you're giving them or what you're selling or what service or product or program you're providing is 20 to 30 times more value than the money they're giving you.
how to master new age marketing, how to really become a marketing genius, how to understand the purpose of marketing and why it matters is such a big topic as well, okay? So we're gonna talk about kind of a plan to, to keep your existing customers and clients, but remember, raving fans is, is the key here. So creating raving fans is the key. You gotta market to get fans, you have to turn the fans into potential clients and customers, then you have to over deliver to keep them coming, and eventually, the number one key to marketing is becoming the leading authority, right? That's the key, to, that, that's the end result, right? When you're the leading authority, you don't have to market anymore. You can listen to people say you always market, I know a lot of people that are the leading authority that don't have to market because so many leads are coming to them and they've mastered their uh, application process and making it exclusive and their price point and all that stuff as well. Now, it's not to overwhelm you because there's a lot of different layers, but I just want to make sure you're on the right track and you have to have something to look forward to to know where to get to, right? So that's a huge key. So what I want to do is, yes, we're going to talk about marketing and I think as I'm speaking, I think I want to ask you your marketing strategies in, in, in a little bit, like after I start talking about some of the marketing, because I don't want to dive in first, but I do want you guys to start thinking about um, what your uh, best marketing strategies and tactics have been over the last two to three years. Now, if you don't have clients, this is probably the most important call you'll ever be on. Because keeping clients, keeping, getting and keeping customers is business. That's just business, right? And if you don't have any, either you don't know how to market or your product's not good enough, right? So you have to figure out where the disconnect is as well. Um, but I want you to start thinking about it. I don't want these calls to be me asking a question and there's crickets. I want us to be engaged and I want you guys to get excited to answer and share value. So start thinking as I'm talking about what action you've taken, what marketing campaign, what video, what connection, what you've done to get the most clients, right? I'm excited to hear from Quincy and I, I'm not sure if uh, Ramaya is on. There's some other people that are, that are great at marketing, um, but I know there's people coming on board. So just be ready for that as well, okay? So let, let's kind of dive in. I'm excited to share some of these things that I've really never shared marketing-wise. Uh, we've just been executing them and I'm excited to kind of open your horizons on what it really is. So first, the, the right mindset in marketing is you have to have a genuine core unshakable belief that what you're giving them or what you're selling or what service or product or program you're providing is 20 to 30 times more value than the money they're giving you. It starts with that, right? So your mindset has to shift. I did a mixtape track. Actually, it's on the newest mixtape coming out. So you haven't heard it yet, but my mindset flipped. When people used to book me to speak, I used to, this is my mindset. I, I cannot believe they booked me. This is crazy. They're going to pay me 5K. Now I get paid four, four or five times that to be keynote speakers. I got booked to speak in Dubai and Tokyo. But now my mindset is, of course they booked me. Why wouldn't they? Who the heck else would they book? See the difference there? So it's like, of course they booked my services. Of course they hired me. Why, who else would they hire? right? So that has to flip and that comes from mastering your craft and it comes from getting results. So that's the core belief. Whatever you have to do to get there is the key, right? Here's the reality. Most people spend all their time on the doing, on the creating, on the studying, on the actual thing, the course, the content, the product, the material, right? Which is great, but you should spend most of your time on the marketing of the thing. Let me say it again. Most people spend all their time on the thing, like their product and program, making it the best, which is step one. But then they continue to just spend time on perfecting their product and program when they should spend the time on the marketing, getting it out there, making connections, creating things at scale, right? Marketing and advertising is what really matters. And most people spend their time on all the other stuff, not the marketing. There's no dead end to a great business and to a consistent business if there's a good marketing system. So most things don't matter when it comes to scaling your business. Only 10, 20% of things matter, which we'll talk about. But you got to focus on things that add to your scale and add to the awareness of your product. And you want more reach and revenue in your business. So if one of your goals is to market and one of your goals is to reach more people, once you have the full belief that what you're doing is of good service and you know it's the best option out, 
then you ask yourself, is this going to increase my ability to, to uh, get my product out though? Or is it going to take it away? Is this going to expand my influence and expand my product or not? Right? So that's a huge key. So what I want to talk about is, like I said, the best type of marketing and I'm going to get into tactics, give you guys eight bulletproof tactics, but I wanted to give some context first. Um, the best type of marketing is becoming the go-to source, right? That's the best type where you have referrals coming in. People are ranting and raving about you. They continue to tell other people about you because you promised, you under-promised and over-delivered versus the opposite. Most, it's not that difficult these days to, to do one-on-one -on -one or to close a sale, because you can talk your way into closing a sale. You can promise, you can over deliver, you can, till you're blue in the face, tell them this is the best product. But eventually, if you can't over deliver, that catches up with you, right? So you wanna create a product where you don't have to sell it, it sells itself because of the exclusivity, and then you over deliver, okay? So the best type of marketing is to become the go to. How you do that, there's a couple things. One, you have to make your business about something, a movement, okay? Whether it's connected to a charity, I don't know, but you have to rally the troops right? You have to go against something, make it about something. It can't just be another marketing company, another website company. You can't just be another speaker. You can't just be another real estate agent, another social media influencer. There's too many of those. You have to be the, right? So make it about something. Think about Disney. And I've talked about this before, but think about Disney. It's not about movies or about an amusement park. It's where dreams come true. Subway went from a fast food place to a weight loss program. Are you kidding me? Right? Right when it switched its positioning, it blew up. Harley Davidson, live to ride, ride to live. So what are you about? If you don't know what you're about, then how will your customers know? Right? So when you make your business about something that is a bigger, something bigger than themselves, everybody wants to be a part of something. If you can make it to where it's somewhat of a movement, right, to be a part of it, that's a huge key. There's movement watches that came out. They're crushing it, right? There's a lot of companies that, that they're, they're bigger than just the brand and just the product, right? And those are, the, those, those are what you want to create with your business, right? Then you got to figure out who your business is for. Like, what are you about? But also, who is your business for? Understand exactly who your business is for and what the purpose of your business is. I talked about this in one of the masterminds, but this is a huge, huge key. Think about what the purpose of a specific business is. What is McDonald's like focus? Does anyone know what McDonald's sells? And if, you, if you've heard me talk about this at the mastermind, don't share, but what does McDonald's sell? Maybe have some guesses in the chat. What does McDonald's sell? What's the number one thing McDonald's sells? Time, a system, a Coke and a smile, no. Happiness, no, definitely not. With that food. Okay, good job, Gavin. So convenience, that's, all, that's what they sell. So they don't care about anything except convenience. Do they care about the burgers being good or bad or healthy? No. They, do they care about the workers? No, they care about convenience. So when the movie came out, so every decision they make from the top to the bottom is, is it more convenient? Like people think when the, when that super size me came out, their sales would drop, they stayed the exact same and then got bigger. Why? Because if they do a documentary on how the McDonald's is unhealthy, nobody cares because they're not eating McDonald's to be healthy. Why would they care if it's healthy or not? They, they're not eating there to be healthy. They're eating there because it's fast and cheap, right? So if a documentary comes out slandering McDonald's because their food's unhealthy, now, if they slandered that it wasn't convenient, that might shift some people. But if they talked about how it's bad food, who cares? The people eating there are not eating there to be healthier. They're eating there because it's fast and cheap. So you have to understand the purpose of your business. Every decision they make is based off convenience. Louis Vuitton is the same thing. It's not convenience, but it's what? What does Louis Vuitton sell? Louis Vuitton has the same material as Coach but one is 3,000, one is 300. What does Louis Vuitton sell? It sells an emotional feeling. When you have Louis Vuitton, you feel different. It sells a status, it sells a feeling. So every single thing that comes out is based on that. Is this gonna increase their emotional frequency? Is this gonna increase their feeling? Status, right? It's not about the best material. 
Because if it was, people wouldn't buy it because there's other brands that are cheaper that have better material. So if it comes out tomorrow and it's like Louis Vuitton has been a scam and has the worst material, it's from China, wouldn't change much unless that changes the status of what people look like when they wear it. So most people don't know what business they're in and it's really hard to master marketing if you don't know what business you're in, right? Grubhub is crushing it. All these places are crushing it in the online world and in the app world because convenience. There's massages that come to you. There's food. We ordered food from, uh, uh, we had someone pick up our groceries last week, right? It's crazy. Kirk, if you're on, Kirk knows one of our game changers. He sells peace of mind. He doesn't just sell websites. He has one of the top marketing agencies in all of Texas, making over seven figures now, which he started, he was making 160K three years ago because he's selling peace of mind. A lot of those big companies, they just need a website. They don't care if it converts as much. They just, they want to feel like they're online and people can see their presence. So he's selling peace of mind, not websites. So you have to really figure out what problem you're solving and what the purpose of your business is. Because a lot of times, it's not what you think it is. Okay, next, you have to take advantage of influencer marketing. Doesn't matter who you are. Having people that have a pulse on your audience, having people that already have an impact on your audience, having a people that have a raving fan base that is a perfect ideal audience that would possibly wanna buy your stuff, connecting with them. It's the best money can buy as far as marketing goes. Right? A lot of companies are doing this and a lot that aren't are going out of business. We've had Uber, Bose, Marriott, PayPal, National Car Rental, Walgreens, Vitamin Water, this AI company, 99designs, Upwork. We've had all these companies reach out wanting to pay us to promote them to my audience. Right? I say yes to some and no to some if it doesn't match, obviously, my values and my brand. But this is going to go crazy the next couple of years. So you have to understand the power of making sure your company is on social media and the perception is exactly what you want it to be, right? And then of course, leveraging technology, leveraging testimonials, leveraging customer referrals. You need to get to a place where knowing what you deliver is so good that if you don't learn how to sell it and market it, you're doing the world a disservice. Right, so an example, I was just talking to Caleb, my wife, and I was talking to a couple of our team, we have like an advisory board for the academy and we were just talking this morning about I was preparing for this call. I was excited about getting this call out, the marketing and answering your questions and sharing some nuggets I've never shared. And I'm like, man, if people don't get value, we, I feel like we're way over delivering for the content and for the speakers that we have. So we don't get this often, but maybe every once, one, a couple times a year, someone's like, I don't know if I got the value. And then they either didn't log in or they never took any action. But we know with certainty that we're excited that people are going to get massive value and be over delivered to because of how much time we put in. Now it took a while to get to that place, but that's the place you want to get to. That's where you're going to create a flawless reputation, right? So those are a couple things on how to kind of become the go-to understand what you sell, take advantage of influencer marketing, understand social media, leverage testimonials, customers, referrals, and make your business about something. Then marketing is easier when you do all those things. Right. So when it, in, in terms of getting your message out there, in terms of actually marketing, nothing beats authenticity and passion, but you have to live in the head of your prospect and client. Okay. So write this down. If you're going to write anything down, live in the head of your prospect and client, finish the conversation they're already having in their head and think about what they're laying in bed at night thinking about. What are the problems that they need solved? What is frustrating them? If you can enter a conversation already going on in their head, that's a game changer. You, you are at a very, very big advantage over every other company. So when we realized, and when Kirk realized, it's not about Webs it's just websites. It's about people want websites. Some want websites to make money. Some want them for peace of mind. Some want them for positioning an image. You don't know until you ask your customer, right? So if you market to, to everybody, you're marketing to nobody. That's why it's so important to, to know who your target audience is. But your job as a marketer is to raise your audience's ambition. So what's the real ambition for your ideal customer, right? It's... Problem-based marketing is, is 
becoming a thing of the past. Now it's more aspirational based marketing. It's more talking to their ambitions and talking to their aspirations and their dreams, goals, and what they want versus just the problems. So you want to answer the question that's already going on in their head, right? Another key is watching people try to do your thing and failing. So this was a big hack that I learned a long time ago. Watching people try to build online businesses, watching people in my previous company try to build companies and try to hire people and train people and create a culture and, and how to scale and leverage. Watching people was painful. Once I figured it out and I watched them, I knew exactly how to market to those people. So what are people doing the wrong way in your industry? That's where you get, you can make a whole video on like why people are failing and how not to fail, right? This is where you get to understand why and how they struggle. Use that in your marketing. That's a huge key. Okay, use that in your marketing. Right, so I wanna give you guys some marketing mastery. These are things that have to ha you have to have when you're marketing. And marketing is, is, is influence. Marketing is, is getting your message in front of the right people and making it so valuable and such a no-brainer that it, it, it's inevitable they're gonna buy from you because you're the best option, because you have the right client. Remember, marketing is key. The likelihood of someone responding to you because you want something is obsolete. And if you're, the biggest mistake people make is they're promoting their ex expertise their uh, skills when you're not solving the problem or promoting the solution to their problem, right? So you have to make sure you're understanding these eight things and you include this in your marketing when you're actually creating copy and ad, uh, whatever it is, right? So let's talk about mastering mindset marketing. Okay, first thing, change. Okay, you're investing in change. People are looking to invest in change. Our program gets them blank. This change. The, my company gets you this change. People are looking, people love change, but they hate transition. Okay? They love change, but they hate transition. So if you can kind of close the gap with transition and say, hey, you will change. I know it's not, it's going to be messy, but we take care of all that for you. If you can hit a marketing message that says, oh my gosh, he understands me, you're going to attract the right people every single time, right? And remember, it's easier, it's easier, 10 times easier to sell a $50,000 watch to the right customer than a $20 watch to the wrong customer. Let me repeat that. It's easier to sell a $50,000 watch to the right customer than sell a $20 watch to the wrong customer. So it's, it's never really a price issue, right? It's never really a price issue because if, if you feel like your price is too high or too low, you just gotta shift your audience. You just gotta shift your audience, right? So change, people are looking to invest in change. Next, newness. Now, by the way, guys, this is 100 plus hours of, of being in the trenches research. This is... Uh, I don't want to say an obsession, but this is a lot of uh, trial and error in the last 10 years. So, so this is new. I call this new age marketing because as you guys can realize what worked uh, 10 years ago doesn't really work anymore. Things are changing and you see some of the biggest companies going out of business because they're not adapting and adjusting, right? So these are the new things that you want to really master and focus on to stay ahead of the curve. So next is newness. This person this company is bringing cutting edge research. You're always innovating, bringing new information, teaching what's working now, not five years ago. This is why we redid all the content two, two and a half years ago. Because I created some of it in 2012 and 13. I'm like, I got to recreate this. And probably end of this year or early next year, I'll recreate all the content so it's newer and more relevant. Some will stay the same. Some timeless principles stay the same. But all the old school gurus say nothing changes, right? And <laughs> it's the biggest lie you can say. Okay, so newness. They want to invest in newness. Next is different. What makes your program different? I've talked about this a lot, but the question is not if you've heard it. It's are you executing on this? Get distinct. Right now, figure out three things that make your business or your personal brand different. You're the CEO of your life, your brand, and your business. So if someone comes up to you, you need to be ready for someone to say, what makes your business different? 
dude, I'm, I'm working with 45 website uh, companies. I don't know which one to choose. What makes yours different? And if you're saying things that sh you should be executing on already, you're not going to uh, trick anybody. So if you're like, oh, we're loyal and honest. Oh, really? That's great to know. Thank you for being loyal and honest. We appreciate that, right? No, everyone's loyal and honest. Okay, you got to think about that. So what makes your business different and unique? And you can articulate that in a way where they're like, oh, wow. And a little hack is looking at your competitors, seeing where the problems lie, seeing where the negative reviews lie, and seeing where the people have messed up in the past and using that as your, your leverage. So if you're a caterer and you're starting a catering business and you look online and almost every negative, there's only, let's say there's only 5%, 10% negative reviews on all the other companies, but it's the same review. They're always late or there's a disconnect in the food and the pictures or they were rude to the guests. Whatever the most negative reviews are, you flip that to your advantage. We make sure we over deliver um, or we get there early. We make sure you have an amazing experience or get your money back and it's free. Here's the benchmarks that we uh, measure by. And obviously you want to protect yourself against people taking advantage of you, but just think about the negative reviews or what people don't like about a lot of uh, businesses, right? One of the things I hated in 2010, 11, 12 was almost every program I invested in and every mastermind I invested in was garbage. It wasn't real tactical. And I didn't, I, I didn't like that they accepted everybody. So what I do, I need to create something that's exclusive and get and promise myself to give real tactical content that actually adds value to people because there's so much fluff and so much BS. Now this might not frustrate some people, but it really frustrated me. And now the right people who don't like fluff, some of you guys are in this academy because you related to my content and you can't stand fluff, right? Some of you guys are here because of that. And some people who are like, ah, I don't care. Peter's too, too, uh, too direct and too intense. I like someone else that is more of the feel good, believe in yourself. If that's you, you're probably not going to be on the Academy, right? So it's just knowing your audience, but figuring out what makes it different. Next is relevance. Okay. How relevant is your company? A lot of millennials can't relate to these old school gurus because they're not changing any of their content. So what's relevant in your company? functional okay functional real tangible how can how can they use this and succeed with it how can they use this and get a result so tools templates worksheets things they can copy things they can do to get ahead things they can do to get a competitive advantage uh if you follow this you will get this result right so functional next one is comprehensive this word alone is valuable in marketing right this is the world's most comprehensive membership for entrepreneurs, for professionals, for sales managers, whatever it is. This covers all the basics, so you won't have to go to seminars. This is the most comprehensive training. Now, only use it if it's actually comprehensive. I'm assuming you guys will have goodwill and uh, honesty, obviously, but figure out which ones are most relevant that you can use based on your current company, right? Attitude. People associate an attitude with your product or programs. And then symbolism, always want to display symbolism because people get associated with something. So whether it's a something that you have in your, uh, in your business that can be something memorable or something that people could say, oh, that's that company, right? And then of course, movement is invaluable in marketing. You want your prospects to look at what you're doing and associate what you're doing as the new movement. This is the new, I've helped people in the academy and I've helped people in, in different workshops I've ran and different speeches I've done Q&A for. People want to create the new way to do something. That should be the name or the title of the website. The new way to do real estate. The new way to do something. The new way uh, to do dentistry. I don't know what it is. The new way to be a chiropractor. The new way to blank, right? I don't know specifically every single person's business. I actually know a lot of your businesses, but this is the new way to do it, right? The old way is not working anymore. This is the new way to sell your home, right? So it has to be bigger than you and me. And a movement is something that is working towards a greater cause. This is the new industry standard, right? And then lastly is leadership. When, you, when your prospect looks at your stuff or your product, they kind of want to be led, right? A lot of people are looking for people to lead them. This will lead them into a better life. Okay. Driven by growth and contribution. 
But when you fall in love with your clients more than your business, you have it figured out. So when you under promise over deliver and you use these specific things that are relevant to your business, then you can test and try out different avenues, whether it's influencer marketing, whether it's email marketing, whether it's ads, whether it's direct mail, right? Whether it's, I mean, I wouldn't recommend billboards anymore, but sadly some companies are still using them, right? So when you're creating content, remember these four things. Make it new, interesting, effective, and responsibility, which means almost make it your responsibility to get them the result they want. So new, interesting, effective. So what I would do, and what I did, is write all these down, you already have them, listen to this again, but really make sure you figure out if your marketing messaging, if your posts on Facebook, if your videos you're creating, have an aspect of some of these in there. Okay, you can hear a lot of this in almost all of my content. And I'm, I'm always willing to give you guys behind the scenes and give you everything I use. There's no secrets with me in the academy. So there's a lot of things we've done to make sure it's a strategic uh, approach, right? And just a lot of businesses aren't strategic. They're two random acts of action versus intelligent and purposeful action, right? And marketing is something you just got to figure out.